The Heli Cancer Chain Show airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. The podcast always available online at HeliCancerChain.com. Both from the right and the left, this is what I've been getting a lot of. I don't know if you are. I'm curious to ask. And that is this. They say to me, don't tell anybody, but I hope that Donald wins. I'd vote for him. Do you hear any of that? A little bit. And and that makes sense to me. You know, I think there are campaigns that have been run in the past where people, maybe it's not socially acceptable to say you're for this particular candidate. Barry Goldwater had a great slogan, which was, in your heart, you know he's right. <laughs> we sort of suggested the inner conflict people had about voting for him. So, yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think the polls could be underestimating him. Hmm. Could it be that the polls are underestimating the support of Donald Trump? Bet that thought keeps a lot of people awake at night. Donald Trump. There hasn't been a candidate on the political stage quite like him in some time, if ever. And today, on the Helly Caster Jane Show, we're taking an in-depth look into the man and the candidacy of Donald Trump. Hi, and welcome to the Helly Caster Jane Show. I am Helly Caster Jane. Joining me at my table in the first half hour is veteran journalist and the esteemed political editor of Newsweek magazine, Matthew Cooper. And in the second half hour, media maven and author of a brand new fascinating book, The Hook, Richard Krebelin. But before we begin, today, The Haley Caster Jane Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Get a free audiobook and 30-day trial by visiting my website at HallieCasserJane.com and clicking on the Audible.com icon for your free book. Hey, what's more fun than a free book? And remember, The Hallie Caster Jane Show is always available online at HallieCasserJane.com and a host of venues including Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, TuneIn Radio, iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, and on the iHeart Radio Network. Journalist and veteran White House correspondent, Matthew Cooper is known for his in-depth reporting and analysis from Washington. Mr. Cooper has worked for some of America's most prestigious magazines, including Time, The New Republic, National Journal, and U.S. News and World Report. He wrote for Newsweek in the 1990s and rejoined the relaunched magazine in 2014 as political editor. Cooper also earned national attention during the CIA leak case when he was held in contempt of court and threatened with imprisonment for his refusal to name his sources and to testify before the grand jury regarding the Valerie Plame CIA leak investigation, a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. He has appeared on 60 Minutes, Meet the Press, Hardball, The O'Reilly Factor, and This Week with George Stephanopoulos. He has covered Donald Trump extensively. His hard-hitting and insightful profiles of the Donald for Newsweek, always well worth the read. Let's talk. So, boy, oh, boy, will you listen to me? We are jumping into a minefield here. Donald Trump has set the political world on fire, and as we said in our promo, which you didn't listen to, he's flummoxed the best of them, but not you, Matt. Back before he really zoomed to the top and began dictating the zeitgeist for this election cycle, you said he would have a heck of an influence in this race. And guess what? You were right. It is all about the Donalds. So come over and all. I love to come over. So... This is rather remarkable, wouldn't you say? Well, it is. You know, I think you have to really go back to like uh, Wendell Wilkie in uh, <laughs> in 1940 and think about somebody with no political experience who was uh, shaken up, uh, you know, political race so much. I, Eisenhower was, of course, uh, not a politician. He was a general, though. Wilkie, like Trump, had not been in government and um, – this this is an unprecedented. You know, so uh, this is what I want to do with you. There's tons to this story. But let's begin with Don, the Donald Trump that you know. You've interviewed this guy. You know this guy. Is he more reasoned than the media is portraying him? I mean, how informed is he on national security issues and other core issues, tr- free trade, taxes, and social security and all? What, 
what do you, what's your take? Well, look, you don't you don't get to be a kind of businessman with kind of global assets, you know, in China uh, and other places without having, you know, some knowledge of the world and markets and currencies and trade. It's not like Herman Cain who'd been the CEO of Godfather's Pizza and then had retired and it's different. He's he's obviously, you know, uh, kind of informed. He's very proud of saying he went to the Wharton School of Business. You know, that said, kind of worldliness is not enough, right? I mean, you sort of, you know, George W. Bush was famously incurious about the world. And I think Trump has a certain similarity there. There are some things he doesn't want to know about and isn't open-minded about. Uh, you know, I think other things he is. You finished? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I was just going to say, you know, who, who knows, you know, right? Some people think, oh, my God, he's a fascist. Others say he's just an entertainer. You know, would a Trump presidency be like Schwarzenegger in California? You know, not not great, but not the end of the world. It's anybody's guess. Clearly, there are reasons for this popularity among certain segments of the voting public, and, and not all of them, by the way, Republicans. There is an increase in economic insecurity, right? I mean, these are hard times. Really? There's that, that increase in economic insecurity, a backlash against immigration, a fear of terrorism, for sure, mm -hmm. right? And then there's this. The decline of the traditional media, I hate to say that to you, Mr. Newsweek, all of that yeah. happened under the watchful eye of traditional Democratic and Republican leaders. Bro if it's broke, why not fix it? Well, I, I agree. And, you know, I think the one of the most important kind of lines he said on the campaign trail, which didn't get a lot of attention, but it really riles up the crowd, is like, they should ban teleprompters. I mean, he hates the idea. And, and audiences do, too, have scripted, poll-tested candidates. And um, he he is, you know, trying to, you know, break out of the mold of traditional politics. And I think when he says, you know, I've bought and paid for politicians, money rules the system. He sounds a lot like Bernie Sanders, and and that really resonates. And he's right. <laughs> I, you know, I, I want to focus on the media for a minute because it seems absolutely frustrated to the point of even being rabid about this Trump candidacy and moreover his staying power. And other than you <laughs> and a few ger veteran journalists, particularly on the cable news shows, it seems like the pundits feel put out, downright puzzled over the fact that the public wants more and more Donald, no matter how outrageous he is. And, and I'm wondering, talk to me about this, if the media is out of touch with the public or out of control over its lack of control over this particular candidate. And I want to cite some. Did you see Meet the Press Sunday? Um, I, I didn't. I read the reports about it. But. Chuck Todd, hear right. me. He was foaming at the bit. He was frothing. I mean, he w and, and you know, Trump had to calm him down. It was hilarious. But what's the deal with the media? There is a problem here. I think. Well, I, I, I think there there's so many issues with the media. I mean, first, they do like him because he's great for ratings, right? right? So they love these debates. It's like for the cable networks, it's just like manna. I right. mean, they love it. They could not have enough of these. But on the other hand, the kind of political chattering classes, you know, kind of completely got this wrong, right? They, they said, oh, he's a joke. He's not going anywhere. Then he did really well. And they said, oh, well, this time it's going to fade. He made fun of John McCain, or this time, you know, he made fun of someone else. There's no way he's going to still be in the race. And, you know, here he is. He's still leading the race. So their their instincts are bad because they they are used to measuring campaigns by, you know, kind of old standards like, you know, don't make a gaffe, uh, collect endorsements, um, line up your delegates, raise enough money, you know, all things that Trump has no interest in. And 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 he goes over the heads of the media. I mean, you've got a guy. I can't think of anyone else who would be comfortable tweeting on their own. I mean, the rest of them who tweet all have staff. Oh, my God. You know, yeah, and there are sure. like meetings about what the tweet is and how what we tweet today. And, and, and people can tell that, whereas you've got Trump 24 hours a day tweeting. And it does go over the heads of the media. And, you know. The media can either kind of, they don't have to embrace Donald, but they have to at least be aware enough to understand what's happening and why he's popular. You know, in a similar vein, it appears that the electorate is calling the shots here. This is something sort of new. Maybe during Ross Perot's time, they kind of yeah. they kind of rallied around him. But it's not the media who's calling the shots, although it certainly is trying to influence the voters. And, and here's something that made me crazy last week. They get excited because Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz are moving up in the polls. GMAT, all the way from 6 to 8%. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And Donald is still at 33, up to 40-whatever, too, given you know, the week or whatever. And I'm going, what is this? 
the other night on, on, on O'Reilly. O'Reilly is actually going, I'm going to interview him, and, and, and I think I got a way to do it that I'm going to bust him because I haven't been able to do it. I mean, this is like crazy stuff. Yes? It is crazy stuff. I mean, I think the political class has kind of got this so wrong. How do they dig themselves out of it? That's the question. Yeah. I, I mean, I think they just still don't understand that, um, you know, the rules have changed, uh, you know, whether whether Trump's the nominee or not, he's shown how this system can be upended. And they're still they're still covering the last race. I think they the idea of Rubio rising sort of makes sense to them. They're like, okay, you know, he's a he's a he's a nice young senator. And, you know, he kind of plays well with others in Congress. And he can raise money and, oh, he's Hispanic. They can sort of, you know, make sense of that. But people like, you know, Carson, Trump, Cruz, to a lesser extent, they they don't know what to think. It is just utterly bizarre. So the, you mentioned before, I'll mention it now again. Trump has been called a racist, a fascist, an idiot, dangerous, histrionic. How about just smart? Well, they're not mutually exclusive, right? I mean... Um, <laughs> Only you would say look, that. It's, it's true. Not, it is true. Obviously, You're right. Obviously, you know, he's, um, he's a smart guy. There's been no evidence in his uh, personal life of of prejudice or, or um, you know... Even womanizer, right, women crazy, his, uh, right. Businesses. I mean, yeah. there's no... You know, if someone were asked you before he declared his... Or three, four years ago before he got into the birther thing, if he, uh, if he was a racist, there was really no evidence of that. Now, that said, you know, the obsession with Obama's birth, uh, long after, you know, right. more than enough proof had been offered, is a little weird. And the uh, the line about Hispanics is rape is, you know, weird. And I think he's certainly given, you know, I think, uh, you know, Hispanics especially reason to have pause about his candidacy. But that said, you know, I think the media sort of assumes that someone who's really tough on immigration wants to close up the borders more or less for a while and really crack down is is a is a racist and that's not fair no and and, and i and, and and they should be called out on it and it's enorm uh, phenomenal to me that nowhere in the media has anybody called out the media on its own histrionics because everything that they're talking about, uh, that Donald Trump is, they're doing the same thing right now. And I, I'm sorry to be bashing the media, but no, this, is the, okay. fir- this is the first time I've ever seen this or at least been aware of just how off the mark they are. I mean, I thought they were wildly prejudiced toward Obama last, you know, in 2008. That's fine. I, I don't think that people talked about it. But this is something very different. And it's coming from the left and it's equally coming from the right. And it's it's rather bizarre to me that nobody, you know, who are watchdogs of the media have really come out and, and come down on the media. But uh, let me throw this out there. First of all, let me say this. Is Donald Trump just another pretty face? Let me be sexist. <laughs> I mean, right. He's not. That's the point. Right. He's a smart guy. We, we've established that. Right. Yeah. OK. So now let me throw this out there. Is it true that Trump win or lose right on the issues or even wrong has done this country a lot of good? I want to know what Matt Cooper thinks about that. And let me say I'm not talking about increasing viewership, as you mentioned on, you know, the networks and stuff and cable. I, I'm just talking. Maybe maybe his being so frank and forward and being, you know, inoculated against the hits opens him up to having actually maybe helped in the long run to a dialogue that was long overdue to have. We're full of SH, you know, T in this country right now when it comes to politics. That's a right. thought. Well, I think you were, um, I, don't, I think the short answer is we don't know what his impact will be until this is over. Um, in other words, I think, I think if he has more kind of uh, racially charged comments and uh, things like that, I, I think that will diminish his, his legacy. But look, he's, he's upended, he's shown people a possibility for politics, right? Where, where the candidate is not scripted and where the candidate says bluntly, money runs politics and the U.S. US is sinking compared to other countries. And that's that's a powerful thing he said. And you know, I think that will be that will be the most important part of his legacy unless you know, unless he, he clouds it by, by going into these other issues. It'd be curious to me as to whether or not he can pull himself out of the corner that in some ways he's gotten himself into, which is he has to be bigger, he has to be bolder, he has to be more outrageous than things that he says. And that served him to a point, but it's, he's, I think, gotten getting to the point, if he hasn't gotten to the point where he needs to, you know, right the ship a little bit and, and, and get down to a little bit more, um, you know, basic, you know, humanity in terms of 
political, you know. Well, I, I think that's right. You know, one thing that's interesting about him that I wrote about early on is that, you know, he doesn't want to cut Social Security and Medicare. Right. And that has, uh, uh, you know, the rest of the Republicans can't wait to do that. And that has a lot of appeal. You know, but that's not something he talks about as much anymore. Not long after he announced, he went down to the border to, a, uh, I was down in, I think, Laredo, right. maybe El Paso. But, you know, Hispanic-run city, had very good meetings with the mayors, uh, went and saw the border, uh, got along with the officials. But he hasn't done a lot of that since then. I think there's a way he could sort of keep the anger going and not seem as, as, as foolish. Right. And, and as petty as he sometimes can be. You, you didn't hear the other part of the interview that I did earlier today, but but I would say to you that I said if he can pull that off, he deserves to win. I mean, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, one of the but, things that we're, what, you're going to say something? I keep doing that. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, that may not be who he is. I mean, he may like the fight so much that right. he's not sort of able to do it a different way. But, you know, but look, we're going to see this process is we're coming to the end of the beginning. Right. Right. But we're still at the beginning. Right. One of the things that I believe that's been missed in this, and I wanted to talk to you about this, too, and it's in the understanding of Trump. Trump is the businessman. He's the corporate leader, even the thought leader, if you will. I mean, he's an executive. Let's talk this. And though clearly somewhat political savvy, we both know he's not a politician, or as media types like to point out, a traditional politician. As a true executive, and listen to me on this one, Matt, running for the office, he, by the way, that's what he's doing for the presidency of the United States, the executive branch, right? The head president of the company, which it happens to be the USA. So he's an idea guy. He's not first and foremost a policy wonk. And and that's something that I think is appealing about him, at least to people that I speak to. I think that's what a lot of people are paying attention to. He's not mired in the very political dogma that these other bozos, if you will, I shouldn't say that bozos, but you know what I'm saying. Isn't that how he addresses the issues as concepts? Not vague, yeah. but as yeah. conce- conceptual. And there's a big difference. He's being accused of being vague when I think he's conceptual. Talk to yeah, me. I, think, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with being vague. I mean, you don't really know the challenges you're going to face as president True. and having very detailed plans at this point is is an overrated quality but i i do think there's sort of a fantasy you know voters and and media to have had about whether a businessman can come in and just fix it because they're good at business i mean that's kind of what perot ran on to a lesser extent romney and you know i i I don't think it's that simple in terms of fixing government. I mean, first of all, a lot of good, you know, presidents we've had have not been uh, effective presidents, have not had much private sector experience. I mean, you know, running a thing, Reagan, Reagan never really ran a business, right? Probably the biggest executive to be president was Hoover, who ran a big mining company, where Jimmy Carter ran a pretty big agribusiness. I'm not, I'm not sure being a businessman is necessarily the best training, but it's not, it's not bad. Either. Let, let me interject something on Reagan. Reagan did run a corporation. It was called Reagan Inc. Well, there's no question. He had a lot of gigs and, you know, between the Screen Actors Guild and right. speaking Hollywood's for a GE, business. he People did a lot of interesting things yeah. before he became governor in 66. But, but he didn't run a big organization the way, you know, Trump did or Romney or... Well, I could. But, my point is, I could see Trump getting into office just for the hell of it. Just let's just say this arbitrarily and saying, "All right, we're going to go into each department and we are getting rid of the crap. We're cleaning up. Everybody cut. Do a cut across the board. Twenty five percent. Run it like a business, not like government." Right. Uh, the, right. But the you know the big difference is you gotta the way our system is. You know, the president's got to sell that to Congress and to the country and to interest groups, and they've got to you know that's. That's the way it works. He doesn't have that power. He has to woo it. And, you know, can he woo it? Maybe, but it's not guaranteed. And he's got a problem with the Republican Party, which brings me to another thing. You know, he's running as a Republican. I, I dare say if we were a three-party system and we had an independent party, whatever you wanted to call it, he probably would have been a but much better suited to run there than as a Republican. Do you agree? I think he could make that case, sure. I mean, uh, and maybe that's where his real ideology lies since he was, you know, a Democrat before right. this and right. independent and sometimes he's pro choice and sometimes he's not. He, he might have been happier as an independent, but you know, as you know, this this country has made it incredibly hard for third parties. Right. 
And, and the thing is, he's not a right wing zealot, no matter what he plays the game right now. We both know that. And and I think that there's something else. It's kind of interesting that he comes at this point when the right is so far to the right and the left is like so into kumbaya to the yeah. left that there's really, you know, where do you go? Where do any of us go? I mean, you know, any who are just, you know, like things just a certain way. He fills that bill. He finds that hole. He he uh, he navigates in there, right? Well, I think could have that appeal. But right now he's got a lot of appeal with those very conservative voters well, it's uh, primary. In, the, in the Republican Party. You know, they like him even if he's not the most right wing guy because he's just, you know, they like his affect and 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 uh, how he conducts himself. I'm and, amused um, that in Iowa they like him. I can see in New York. I can see in L.A. I can see in Chicago. I was well, well, Iowa. Well, that's great. Iowa, yeah, you come I mean, a long way, baby. Very, <laughs> I think he's it's going to be very interesting uh, to see how these these primaries play out. Oh, absolutely. And, um, so here's another one. I've heard people say, and people have said to me, he's a symptom. And if that's true, doesn't that ask us to look at the illness he represents rather than tearing him down for pointing out that illness in our government, in our society, in our politics? Well, he's getting the blame. Yeah. Is that fair? He's getting criticized for things he said, and that's just, you know, part and parcel of democracy. I mean, look, there's no question that the political system is is screwed up, and he is a reflection of that. And, you know, uh, he's, and he's doing well with that. Okay. That's what yeah. I, am. <laughs> I don't know if that's, <laughs> that's terribly <laughs> profound, but yeah, in that sense, he's a symptom. Okay, he's a symptom. My point being that I don't think he should get blamed necessarily. I think that that's, that goes into what I was saying earlier about the fact that he may be doing us all a lot of good by being there, whether he gets the nod or he doesn't. It doesn't matter. He's shaken it up a little bit, and he's got people talking about an issue that needs to be talked about. So listen to me. As of today, early polls show that Trump would beat Hillary in the national contest. Your thoughts? <laughs> Well, my my thoughts are the polls are kind of ridiculous, but um, at this point. But that said, look, if he's the Republican nominee, sure, he could win. Why not? Well, I mean, if you're the nominee of one of the two parties, you can win. Okay, that's is uh, that simple. I think it is. I don't think he's he's uh, sure. I mean, I think he's um, yeah. It'll be a big moment. I mean, he could also blow it, but you know, I don't think I don't think we know yet. You, okay, that's that's a question that I should ask you. Do you think that he is going to blow it? What do you think his chances are getting there are? And and I'm asking you, Matt, and, and asking you is different than asking just about everybody else I know in the biz. And you know why? Because you have a just more grounded look at all of this than just about anybody else I know. Fascinates me how you yeah. stay so level. Well, I, pre- I appreciate you saying that. I don't know if I've got any great insight to how he does it. I can think of some states where he's going to do, could do better than others. He's putting a lot of resources into the South. Uh, where there's a big cluster of states um, uh, after the early ones. You know, you think of a place like Las Vegas, I mean, uh, Nevada, you know, right? I mean, he's got his name on casinos there. And, um, Grant, you know, the New Hampshire has had some feisty independent choices in the past, like John McCain, like Pat Buchanan. So, you know, you just don't know. I I don't know. I think he's going to I think he's going to win some states, whether he can be the nominee. I don't know. OK, that's fair. Uh, you don't want to guess, and I don't wa- want you to guess. More than one pundit, most definitely yeah. you, have insinuated that we deride br- Trump at our peril. That's what you wrote in an earlier article. You still think we do? Yeah. And 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 can you elaborate on that a little bit? What what, what would be the effect if they keep do beating up on him? I mean, they just make him more endearing to some, don't they? Oh, I think so. They haven't found the kryptonite, really, that's going to render him incapacitated. I mean, I mean, poor Jeb Bush keeps saying, "Oh, he's not a serious candidate." Right. And, you know, I'm. He's a talker. I'm a doer. And uh, well, the things they keep attacking him on aren't quite working. Including, I mean, I'm a little surprised they don't do more on taxes because. He's so different. His, well, his trade thing is a, it means putting on really big taxes on imported goods. I mean, if I was running against him, I'd do an ad where, like, you know, your TV costs $6,000 and your, your car costs $60,000 because of all his tariffs. And, you know, I mean, Republicans are, you know, Pavlovian in their response to taxes and tax hikes. So I they've, they've flipped at that, but they haven't really concentrated on that. They must be saving it for that day. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know if they're that smart, but they, instead they're just saying, like, oh, he's not ready. 
That's not going to work with anyone. You know, they don't really care. Nor, nor by the way, nor by the way, is calling him a liar working for right, them. They, people assume they're all liars. And uh, so, what's with know. the Republicans? Why, why have they been so ineffective? They're so scared of him. They don't want him. Blah 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 blah. Why are they so ineffective? Do you know? I don't have a good handle on it. I mean, I think they're just they're just kind of personally flummoxed. You know, I think if you've spent your whole life, you know, running for office, as most of them have, then you you believe in you believe that experience and the bills you've passed and your command of legislation is is really important. And the problem is the voters don't really feel that way. And so I think they just keep coming back to this question of experience and they just don't have, they don't have it. Uh, inside the bubble. They're too inside the damn bubble. They're in the bubble. They're and, you the know, bubble. they're also straddling on the immigration thing, right? I mean, they're, he's all in on, on the wall and, and saying it's bad. The rest of them, you know, they want, they want to close the border, but they don't want the wall. They're for immigration reform but the kind of uh, this and that. I mean, I think he's he's made a big stand about immigration. And that's, you know, that's kind of the, the thing that's hiding in plain sight here, right? I mean, that's that's really the issue that's got him center stage. And the rest of them don't have kind of a, kind of a convincing narrative. How scared are the Democrats of him, are of him or how much are they crossing their fingers that he becomes the Republican nominee? Oh, I think they're... Um, I think they're. Uh, I think they feel pretty confident they can beat him. From Democrats I've talked to, that he'll just implode, and um, you know, outside the narrow world of Republican primary voters, he'll he'll be a joke. And uh, but I, you know, I think they dismiss him at their peril. I mean, he's you know, he's good at a lot of this stuff. He's he's got good campaign skills, and um, and he's got a message that resonates. So. so Here's here's an inside the beltway thing. He can't seem to get himself above forty three percent. I think he's hovering what right now about thirty three forty. You know why not? Does he have a chance of getting more than that? And he obviously would have to get a lot more than that to get himself uh, nominated. So well, no, I don't know. I mean, they, you get fourteen candidates, something like that. So to be at forty percent is pretty oh. pretty impressive. Okay. And if everybody, you know, if a lot of them stay in, you can get nominated with uh, less than a majority. I mean, McGovern, had, I think, barely had a third of the vote. It's hard, but it can be done. I, I think, you know, there are obviously a lot of Republicans who just, you know, don't don't like him. I mean, you know, I think especially, you know, he doesn't do as well with women. And, um, you know, there are some minority Republicans. They're not as into him. And, you know, I think his libertine, you know, past the three marriages and I'm not sure, you know, the gambling and uh, I'm not his gambling, but the gambling business. Uh, I, you know, there are probably some conservatives who balk at that. You know, no one's going to win all the Republicans, but to be where he's at is pretty good. So you have to win some in the middle, too. So let me give you some anecdotal stuff that I've come across. You know how many people I've spoken to, and you know, most of the people I know are pretty politically savvy, you know, and paying attention, both from the right and the left. This is what I've been getting a lot of. I don't know if you are. I'm curious to ask. And that is this. They say to me, don't tell anybody, but I hope that Donald wins. I'd vote for him. Oh, my God. I can't say that out loud, but that's the truth. Do you hear any of that? Um, a little bit. And, and that makes sense to me. You know, I think there are campaigns where they uh, that have been run in the past where people uh, maybe it's not socially acceptable to say you're for this particular candidate. I mean, Barry Goldwater had a great slogan, which was in your heart, you know, he's right. <laughs> We sort of suggested the inner conflict people had about voting for him. Right. You know, that it wasn't uh, wasn't something they necessarily wanted to tell their neighbors. I mean, so, yeah, I, yeah. Think the, I think the polls could be underestimating. And that's what, what my point was. And I, I, I kind of think that they are, too. So, so, Matt, the end of the day, and we'll have you back, of course, as this thing goes along. I'm always along. delighted to come back. I just, you have no choice. But here, here's the last thing I'm going to ask you today. And I'm going to say, so, Matt. How do we solve a problem like the Donald tra la <laughs> well, well, I think if you're the Republicans who are running against him, you stop digging, right? I mean, I think you uh, you find a better avenue of attack than what you've been doing. Uh, and, and I think you hit him. I, I suggested the tax thing, but I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are other things um, that you could that you could chide him about. And uh, I don't really see them doing it. Uh, 
And, you know, that's that's what they need to do to stop them. As for the rest of us, that's we just have to decide who we want to vote for. I've been speaking with Matthew Cooper, political editor for Newsweek magazine. For his insightful reporting, visit Newsweek.com or visit him on Facebook at Matthew Cooper. And on Twitter, his handle is Matty Scoop. Richard Crevelin is a consultant, playwright, screenwriter, and professor who leads workshops on all aspects of storytelling. He has flown around the world to teach the art of communication and storytelling to executives, creatives, and brand managers at many different companies, including Vaseline, Pepperidge Farms, Panera Bread, Pond Skin Care, and many, many more. His consulting work has affected hundreds of TV commercials produced all over the world, many of which have won awards. Krevlin is a graduate of Yale University, went on to earn a master's degree from both UCLA and USC. He has taught both undergraduate and graduate classes at USC, UCLA, University of Georgia, Emerson, and Pepperdine. Now Krevlin turns all he's learned from his time-telling stories in Hollywood to the business world in his fascinating new book, The Hook, How to Share Your Brand's Unique Story to Engage Customers, Boost Sales, and Achieve Heartfelt Success. Let's talk. All right, so starting seriously, Richard, in big, bold letters in the back of your book, The Hook, are the words, Make Your Brand's Story Sell. You know, we use that word brand a lot, and I think we toss it around, but what does it really mean, brand to brand? Well, when I talk about a brand, I talk about the beating heart of a product. And I like that. It's really, and my definition of a story is information wrapped in emotion. So a lot of the work I do is about getting in touch with emotions, being heart-based. You know, people all, everybody wants to define their brand. Our brand is better because it's 32% faster or something (laughs) like that. And, you know, we all remember everything was always new and improved and three out of five dentists surveyed. And my work is is emotional work, emotionally differentiating a brand. Coke and Pepsi, they're pretty similar, but they have different emotions connected to them. And that's really the brand work that's done to make you feel different. When you see Coke, you smile, but you don't smile when you see Pepsi. Well, somebody did some good branding to to create that smile. So then you talk about brand DNA and turning your brand DNA into your brand narrative. Take me there. Okay. So what happens is a lot of times I'll work with a company and everybody will have a different take on the brand. I go, wait a second, you're all in the same company. This should be a unified vision. And, And so what we do is we step back and I say, all right, let's define the DNA, the core essence of the, can you do it in a phrase? Can you do it in a sentence? Can you do it in a word? And um, once you get everyone at the company to define the brand with the same words and phrases, you have uniform kind of vision of the essence, the DNA, then you can spin that into stories. You can spin that into what the website should look like. You can spin that into what the logo and the packaging should look like. So it's getting everyone to sign off And this is who we are as a brand. This is what we represent. And then when we tell a story about the product or tell a story about the founder of the company, the theme of that story has to represent that DNA or else you're sending out mixed messages about who you are as a company or a brand. So talk to me about great title for a book, The Hook. Love that title. Talk to me about the hook. Well, you know, that's what we're all trying to do. It's such a crowded marketplace now. There's, you know, you read all these different statistics about how people are being hit with 18,000 commercial messages a day. And so the goal then in this crowded marketplace with a million different messages being bandied about is finding an emotionally compelling message that can hook people. So why should I listen to you? How can I hook you? to make you stop. I mean, everybody, what do you do now with your DVR? You skip over commercial messages. And so my goal in my work with people is to create commercial messages that hook people so they actually want to get the information you have to offer about your product or service because you're helping them. I mean, they say everybody only listens to one radio station, W. I I F M. What's in it for me? And so everybody <laughs> wants to know if you have a message that can 
tell them something that will help their life, then you've hooked them and they want to learn more. So that's what we're trying to do with these brand narratives, tell better stories. And there's more opportunity today to tell stories. You know, think about it. Stories used to be dictated by the advertising agencies. They'd have a 30-second TV commercial on at the Super Bowl, and that was the company's story. Today, we have websites. We have YouTube. We have webisodes. We have all these platforms digitally to tell lots of stories. And then beyond that, you have tribal communities being formed of consumers and users and people who love products and are sharing their stories online with each other. Um, and so it's a new it's a new day for storytelling. Oh, it surely um, is. Yeah, yeah. Something else that, uh, that that you say in this book is that corporations can no longer just worship the bottom line. Consumers and customers want to be associated with brands that align with their values. Boy, that's a really interesting statement. Let me go further with this for a minute. Is that somewhat limiting? I mean, after all, only a percentage of us will align in any value, particularly these days. Everybody's so different and cantankerous with one another. So is the trick to getting people to align with your brand to broaden its values? There's a great quote, by the way, in the book. The bait has to taste good to the fish, not the fisherman. I just I just fished the other day, and so I know that's true. I didn't okay. do well, <laughs> but talk to me. Yeah, so a lot of, well, that you know, that's my favorite quote. I begin every lecture with the bait quote, and a lot of times... We as uh, storytellers, as salespeople, we have stories we love, and sometimes we lose track of the fact that might that might be a story you love, but if the <laughs> audience isn't moved by that story, then it doesn't matter how much you love it. And, you know, you see that with Hollywood, where I come from, we do test screenings all the time. We're constantly testing the stories and altering them, and these are stories they might spend $100 million on, so they better speak to people, and they still fail so often with these big-budget movies that don't succeed. So so there are a lot of different stories out there. My work, to go back to the initial part of your question, uh, which is about really values and aligning yourself through stories with values, is kind of articulated in that question of uh, what you do versus why you do it. I and mean, I think traditionally people wanted to just communicate what this product does. And now we want to know, okay, we understand what the product does. We understand what your service is. But we want to know more before we buy your product. And so, uh, you know, you look at something like Hobby Lobby. There were people who are drawn to Hobby Lobby because of their values. And there are people who are, you know, pushed away from it. So it's a, there, there's a different bar out there today in, in terms of consumers want to know more about companies. They want to know about their ethical practices. They want to know about how they conduct business. And, and, and it's a different game different game. So let's talk values and let's talk this in this age of social media where everybody is selling not their corporation but themselves, right? I mean, we yeah. are like the me, me, me. Let's sell, 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 I, 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 as you said before. And in talking about that and values, let's talk, let's bring Donald Trump into this conversation, values and me, 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 and I, I, I. I mean, is he a great story t- seller? And that's what you use the term story seller. I love that. Or is he not? What's your opinion? Well, you know, he's a great populist, and I think he is out there constantly, and I don't know if this is coming from him or his strategist, but there's somebody in the camp who's tapping into things that are really affecting us all, and he's telling stories that nobody else is telling. Um, so he's thinking about, now sometimes those stories are repulsing people, and sometimes they're alienating, and sometimes they're pulling people in, but he's getting bigger crowds to hear his stories than any other candidate. And and so, yeah, there's something really interesting in terms of the way he's tapping in to these, these deep narratives that exist in the culture that a lot of people I think are afraid to bring up. And he's doing the opposite. He's, he's got no fear and amazing how he can say these things and beyond just surviving become even more popular. So he's doing something in terms of narrative that everyone else isn't, and, and he's got no fear. But it's that ability, to, a great storyteller, it's kind of like uh, the, the vanguard. You know, a great storyteller has the ability, it's what a great artist does. They can tap into something in the culture that we're all unconscious of, and the artist then makes us conscious of it. 
So he's seeing things that people are feeling and no one else is articulating. And he's saying it in a clean, clear way. And there are people who are embracing what he's saying. And there's people who are being angered by what he's saying. But he's saying something that's touching this raw, deep nerve in our culture. You know, you're the one who brought up emotionality. And I think that that is so utterly key. And, and I could say to you that we are living in the most emotional I mean, emotions today, running at the highest decibel, I think, in my lifetime that I can ever remember, you know, after World War II. I wasn't there for that, but you know what I'm saying. And and, and he's playing to that emotionality, I think. Would you yes. agree? Yes, I would definitely agree. And so he's he's fanning the flames and he's riding that wave of smoke to to this kind of amazing. I You know, the only other person I can think of was H. Ross Perot, years ago, kind of came out of nowhere. We mean out of nowhere, meaning not out of the political arena and, and was, was gaining this popular vote because people are so, people just are so upset by the political arena today and what's not being done and, and how politics aren't dealing with the issues that people want to deal with that. We see the two most popular people right now are both political outsiders, Ben Carson and Donald Trump, who both really don't have any political standing at all. Yeah, well, um, that's not a bad thing as far as I'm concerned. I mean, maybe that's what we need for a little uh, short jump in the middle of all and bring us back to some kind of normalcy. But uh, talking to me about this, it, he does stir emotions. And I want to talk to you now as the king of branding, because I think you are, versus Jeb Bush. So a guy like Jeb Bush, poor thing, right? Th this yeah. guy is just... <laughs> <laughs> you know, wow, that's a hard act to follow. That would be like, um, you know, you go on stage and you've got, you know, the, the Beatles and then and then Jeb Bush. I mean, or <laughs> Jeb Bush starts it out. I mean, it's a nightmare of a, a, a place he he's in, finds himself in right now. But in terms of what we're talking about in branding, what can Bush do besides hiring you or at least picking up your book? And let me say the title one more time, The Hook, How to Share Your Brand's Unique Story to Engage Customers, Boost Sales, and Achieve Heartfelt Success. You either got it or you don't, buddy. Is that true or not? And, and seriously, how does this guy Bush overcome his limitations? No decibels. Well, he's, yeah, he's in a big hole right now. Um, I saw his new TV commercial yesterday, and you saw in this commercial he's making a valiant effort to try to be someone who can take a hard line against ISIS and the forces in the world who are working against us. And so you see him trying to speak a different story, saying, I have political experience. I come from a family who stood up to these terrorists. I am different. I can make a difference. I am a tough political realist who knows how to score. And, and so it, it actually was a very good piece of propaganda in terms of um, it stirred emotion in me. It was the first time I saw Jeb Bush as being something other than milk toast. You know, so I, I think he needs to do a lot more of that. And I think he's going to be advised to become a tough guy. And, and, you know, um, and stand up to all these other people. I don't know if he can pull it off. I don't I don't know. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens with the Republicans over the next couple of months. But, but for, um, from, from the position ahead. of a storyteller maven like you, how do you like that storyteller maven? I like, like that. You like that? I like that, too. But from that position, OK, truth, truth is advertising. Is there such an animal <laughs> truth in politics? You can't say it without laughing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. True. It's I like mean... military intelligence. You can't really say it. Yeah. Talk to me uh, about that because, you know, first, and, and let me let me put a little sidebar in here, which is you and I come of a, a, of a time when politics was not what it is today. It used to be that politicians sold ideas. And then, in what, about the time of Kennedy, it became politicians started selling themselves. I'm not saying the media didn't sell th these guys, you know, an Iker or something like that. But, but today, the whole thing is you got to sell yourself. And how do you feel about that? Yeah, well, so the, the point's a good one. I think you, you look at some of the people who were elected presidents, I think, uh, the name that pops into my mind is a guy like Woodrow Wilson, who was 
a brilliant man. I mean, he was a professor. He was a brilliant thinker, but could never win today. And, and so we're just in, it's incontrovertible that this is a different age. I, I think, yeah, you pinpointed the moment that everyone identifies when Richard Nixon was debating JFK and he was sweating on TV. The world didn't want a sweaty president. Um, and Kennedy just looked better, charismatic. And, and, and we said, I, this man's going to represent us. We can't have Nixon representing us. Right. Unfortunately, uh, soon enough, Nixon did become our president. But in this age, the, there's so many more factors than just the uh, political ideology. And so I think the people that are understand that, I think Obama was, was masterful in his use of social media and you see the rise of a new type of candidate that has to understand. I mean, whether you like Trump or not, he's got these brilliant sound bites and he's, he doesn't have to buy TV commercials. Okay. I know he's got know, it's crazy. $10 billion, but he's getting a lot of airtime without ever spending any money on a TV commercial. And so it's interesting what's happening. It's, uh, the, the, it's also crazy. But but let me throw this out to you, Mr. Maven. You say you have to generate interest, enthusiasm, and support of ourselves, our company, and or our product. And, and since we're using politics as our an example today, I, I want to take this out to this. Hillary right now, she's doing everything, at least at this point, to not make any mistakes. She's kind of low on the radar. You know, she's she doesn't want anybody to be paying too much attention to her. You know, they'll come back and haunt her about the emails, blah 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 blah. So, so that's where she is at the at at the at the moment. And and then there's a guy like Lindsey Graham. And let me let me take you here. He can't even get on the radar. So, Professor, what would you be your advice for a guy like Lindsey Graham? I mean, talk to me in terms of narratives. Can you change a narrative in the middle of a narrative that's not working? successfully and what would your advice be to somebody like Graham? Well, you you think in um and I could be wrong here but um uh, with Bill Clinton, he wasn't doing well until James Carville wrote a new brand DNA up on the board. It's the economy, stupid. And with those four words, Clinton changed his fate and you know, so he focused, he changed his story. He started talking about the economy. He rode that narrative into the White House. And, you know, with a guy like Graham, for example, uh, I always start, uh, I have a friend who's spent his entire life in, in politics, working with candidates. And, and he told me something that I love and agree with, which is the first story any candidate must tell is their signature personal story. You know, when we think of JFK, we think of PT-109, Profiles in Courage. Right. He wrote that story. Obama wrote the book about his life. You know, you start with your story, your character, who you are, and you have to hope that that can have a viral quality to it. People, everybody wanted to read Profiles in Courage about this heroic man during during the war. Uh, and so I, I would start with that personal signature story. Who is he? What is makes him special? And then once you establish the character, um, and it's exactly what you're saying, then we're not starting with an ideology. We're starting with a character that people can connect and relate to. The subtitle of the book is all about engagement. We engage, uh, and, and in a way then being unknown is a nice tabula rasa to create a story. Uh, a person like Hillary would have a much harder problem writing that kind of story because we have so much knowledge of her already as a culture. But she might want to try to rewrite that story. You can see she's changed the way she dresses. She changed the way she does her hair. She's trying to be a, uh, you know, it's a, a always interesting to look at how women in the culture are trying to seem both powerful and feminine at the yeah, same time. It's a very hard me, thing to negotiate. I can tell you that's not easy, and it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a sad state of affairs that we have to even think about that. You say we have to demonstrate the benefits and potential of our product. So how best to achieve this, and how is Trump doing here? I, I like this. Demonstrate the benefits and potential. You have to like convince the people that you're something worthy of, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I have to... I would argue that he 
hasn't gotten there yet. Yeah, I um, I agree with that. You're not you, you know, not to argue and, and with that's me. That's probably a, a tricky. He's he's so controversial and he's saying such inflammatory things that he's got our attention. But the question is now, okay, give me some meat. Where's the beef? Okay, you're you're bringing up issues. You know, where's the beef? Okay, you're going to help me with my taxes. How? What do you you know? And and that's I think what the other candidates who are fighting him are trying to say underneath all this rhetoric, where's any substantial, real, legitimate platform that we can look at and say, okay, if we give you the, the, the we make you the Lord of the Rings, we give you the kingdom, the rings, the key to the kingdom, what are you going to do with it? How hard and, do you think the job he has now? Has he dug himself into a, 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 a deep hole that he can't get himself out of? Or do you think he could? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I mean, he's got going so far beyond what I thought he ever could do that I'm afraid to second guess him now. I mean, he, he's, he, he's an extraordinary man. I remember when I was young, I don't know if you remember this, the city of New York was struggling to get a massive, I think it was the convention center built and no one could do it. And the young Donald Trump came in and I don't know how he did it, but almost overnight he, yeah, it was amazing. He was able right. to get something done that no one else in New York could get done under budget and, you know, and in an incredibly short period of time. So those are the kind of narratives. And then everyone in New York thought of him in a different way. So it's an amazing narrative of when he was a young man that put him on the map. And now he seems everyone is kind of astonished how he's telling these stories where it seems like he's inserting his foot in his mouth. Um, and he has a, maybe it's his hair that's saving him. He has this Teflon <laughs> quality uh, that his hair has got so much spray in it that oh, no. nothing, everything bounces, it bounces off, off of him. But I mean, from your, from your, you know, you've just written this terrific book. Everybody knows how great you are at what you do, Richard. Can he? I mean, is your gut telling you, yeah, he could dig himself out of that aspect of what he's created or, or he has a hard job ahead? Oh, well, I think it's going to be hard. I think the more he, it seems like he has to be more and more controversial. He has to say something even more controversial to beat what he said last week. And I don't know how much further he can go. <laughs> so it'll be interesting. Where do you stand? What do you think? Um, I, I think that's the great test. If he can find his way out of this, in other words, he keeps the power that he's amassed. He keeps, you know, the, the, the attention even if he gets it by being outrageous, and at the same time can find a way to brand himself as legitimate, wouldn't that be extraordinary? And then I would have to vote for him because he did it. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? I just don't know whether he can. My bet's on him right now because he has flummoxed everybody. <laughs> I mean, so yeah, I'm well, saying to myself, you know, right you got to give the guy credit where credit is due. And uh, when, you know, and, 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 you know, we were talking off air that, you know, he even got Chuck Todd red faced yesterday, uh, spitting like, you know, saliva to, to the cameraman. He was so, in, in, you know, inflamed by, uh, he couldn't get through to Trump. He couldn't break Trump. They're all trying to break Trump, and Trump is just looking at them like they've lost their cookies. So, yeah, my my bet's on Trump. I mean, I hate to say it, but yikes. I mean, wouldn't that be extraordinary? Uh, I, wa I want to digress for a moment because I want to talk about one other thing in this book of yours, this really, really, really good book that I think everybody who has a website, <laughs> has a, a you know an image on Facebook should read. And the, the book... Is far more than just a branding, a product, or a person, and I want everybody to understand. It's also a wonderful book for developing a story if you're a writer. So pick this book up, my writer friends. There are keys to how to develop the perfect story. It's, it's wonderful. So, Richard, what's the number one thing we should not do in developing our brand? Not do? Not do. Um, <laughs> I don't you like that one. <laughs> it's interesting. You're going negative. We're not going <laughs> negative in this campaign. Well, so, you know, I always, uh, when people ask me uh, uh, to try to articulate, I spent uh, many years teaching writing classes. And in the end, you always had the same question. People always ask me, how come Hollywood has got so much money and they still make so many bad movies? And, and I created this golden rule that's in the book, an engaging character must overcome tremendous obstacles to reach a desirable goal. And so that applies really to any story, any ca political campaign, any 
think, and so we must not create a story where the ca- a character is not engaging, where there is no obstacles and where their goal is not desirable. So that's kind of, I've never articulated it that way, but it's a, it's a negative version of the positive. So we must create characters who are engaging. They must deal with tremendous obstacles and their goals must be something we want them to achieve. So if, if Donald Trump keeps telling stories that, and, and people keep being engaged by him and we see him overcoming these huge obstacles to achieve in a political arena where he's an outsider and we want him to make change for the better in our society, he might just surprise everyone. How about authenticity? Oh, authenticity is huge. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, the thing about authenticity is you can't determine authenticity. Only they can determine authenticity. Right, right. You know, so that that's always what I did a lot of work. Actually, we're talking about writers. A lot of my uh, consulting work has actually been with lawyers in the courtroom because lawyers in the courtroom have to tell stories to a jury. And sometimes uh, it's been said that the guy who wins in the courtroom is the guy who tells the most authentic story. And so both the story must be authentic and the storyteller must be authentic. You can uh, I know a lot of lawyers who have very expensive cars and they won't drive them to the courthouse because they don't want a jury to see them get out of a Maserati. Right. And right. that's not authentic when they're in there fighting for the common man. So I think that issue, I, I talk about it sometimes credibility, sometimes authenticity, but that's, that's everything. And, and, and I always break it down into both the story and the storyteller must both be credible and authentic. And, and that's a, a rare thing indeed today because so many of us are seen as being inauthentic and posing and and creating personas we you know with our aspirational world of facebook where we're just putting pictures up of things we want other people to see how authentic is the persona that you've created via social media so it's 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 probably the core issue i want to go back to uh, trump and politics listen to me any difference between donald trump and all those guys on Madison Avenue, the ad execs, <laughs> is that what our politicians have become? Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, it's funny because when you look up Donald Trump now and Wikipedia, he's known as a TV personality. I mean, that's really, you know, and they did, what, 14 seasons of The Apprentice. So I don't I couldn't even tell you what his true authentic persona is because he's been altered. He was when I, you know, I, as I said, I mentioned uh, the Trump I knew was a real estate guy in New York. You know, nobody really talks about that anymore. They say you're fired and uh, they, they talk about different things. I mean, he brands what you got to give him credit. He gets paid for hotels to use his name. Uh, that, you know, <laughs> if you can just license your name, you know, yeah, that's pretty nice. You know, he's not doing anything. They just they give him lots of money to use his name because people know if it's a Trump hotel, it's going to be luxurious and they're going to care about the, you know, the little things. And uh, but are we uh, ready for the Trump White House? <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not ready for that. But, um, a big sign right yeah, on 1600 yeah. Pennsylvania and Trump lives here. (laughs) Richard, thank you. (laughs) Thank you. It's a pleasure. A lot of fun. (laughs) I've been speaking with Richard Krevelin, author of The Hook, How to Share Your Brand's Unique Story to Engage Customers, Boost Sales, and Achieve Heartfelt Success by way of the Career Press. For more information about Richard and his book, visit www.profk.com www.powerstoryconsulting.com and on Facebook you'll find his page under the book's title. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Hell I Cancer Chain Show, a production of Resac LLC. Associate producer, Suzanne Probst. Music by Tony Rosales Jazz. Visit Hell I Cancer Chain.com.